Hi, I'm Spencer Krauss. I've been building robots for over 20 years. In that time, I've seen a lot of interesting things, and I've heard a lot of interesting stories. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is a place where my colleagues and I can relax, have a drink, and talk about some of the crazier things we've seen at work and some of the experiences we've had that have gotten us to where we are today. Subscribe today to join the collaboration. Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Mashari al Uh Mashari is a robotic systems integration engineer at uh, DeBay Future Labs. Mashari, welcome to the pod. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, no, we've... Uh, yeah. I think we met sort of randomly through LinkedIn and have just been hanging yeah. out. And uh, I don't know, been really enjoying getting to know you. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know, for people listening, uh, we both went to Carnegie Mellon, uh, worked with a bunch of the same folks. So yep. I guess Costa Niku, who's also been on the podcast, uh, you know, worked directly with you at uh, Blue Belt Technologies before they were Smith. And uh, yep. yeah, you got like a few other little weird things in common. So I don't know. Um, I, I've been sort of enjoying kind of learning more about the Debay Future Foundation and Debay Future Labs, sorry, Debay Museum of the Future Foundation and Debay Future Labs. Well, ri- yeah, it was originally Museum of the Future Foundation, but now they've changed the Debay Future. Uh, so now it's Debay Future Foundation, um, but it used to be the Museum of the Future Foundation. Wait, so where does the lab part so, come in? Or is it a foundation and then you got labs inside the foundation? Yeah, so, so it's foundation, um, which was supposed to focus on the museum, but now they're doing all sorts of stuff, museum being one of them. Cool. And the, another thing that they're doing is the, the lab, which is uh, where I work. That's awesome. Yep. Yeah. So those are kind of like the two big, um, I guess, visual things that they're working on. They have, they have a bunch of, they have like an accelerator and uh, they have a fund for uh, startups and stuff. Um, How much are I'm they investing in startups? Started. Can I ask or... Is it like a uniform uh, amount, or is it different depending on the company? I'm not entirely sure. I kind of just uh, I hang out with the robots and don't really care about the finances. Nah, that's fair. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No worries. <laughs> Sorry, I've been having like more like businessy folks on lately. So I just interviewed like a venture capitalist and like a guy that just started a business who's like an engineer still, but he's like the more business savvy of two co-founders and. This right. is good. I'm I'm excited to talk more about the robotic stuff. Okay, so what cool robots are you working on, Mashari? Um, so they mostly do uh, we mostly do like a lot of mobile robots. Um, we had a deployment somewhat recently um, doing deliveries, but it was it was more a proof of concept. Um, at, at this stage, we're kind of uh, we're kind of just trying to show that we are capable of doing things. Uh, the bacon has a. Um, I mean, there, there, there's a lot going on in the city, and like, you know, there's a lot of PR in this in the city, um, and there's sort of this view that uh, uh, it's more about PR than like actually doing something. Huh. Uh, so yeah, we're we're kind of the guys. We're kind of the guys doing stuff. Um, yeah. All the robots are built in house. Um, all the, the entire team is uh, in house. Uh, cool. We don't outsource anything. We don't just buy robots off the shelf and like implement them, but actually like, you know, manufacture them in house in the lab. So what kind of uh, machining capabilities are you guys running then? If you guys are doing all that in house, do you sorry, go down? Uh, you that? Uh, sorry, I said, what kind of machining capes do you guys got? Uh, so like, are you running, um, uh, all vertical sorts, machine? CNC. Nice. We have, uh, all sorts of like 3d printers. Um, uh, they're constantly like welding stuff in the back. Uh, Sweet. It's, it's, uh, I mean, there, there are certain things that are a little too big or like too specialized for us to do. So we work with the uh, local manufacturers. Smart. Um, but, but we're doing all the drawings and just kind of, you know, overseeing it. Um, uh, so like the like enclosures for some of the robots are manufactured by a different company um, in the day. Yeah. Uh, just like a, like a trip down. But um, yeah, pretty much 100%. It's, it's all like built in the uh, not even the country, like the city itself. 
That's really that's cool. That's kind of cool. Yeah, that's yeah. super awesome. Yeah, because I mean, it, you know, like, like I said, the bay does have sort of like, you know, this, this, um, they're, they're, they're really big about show, yeah. um, which is great and it attracts a lot of people. Um, but it also draws, I mean, this is, this is kind of Kuwaiti guy speaking, but it draws a lot of skepticism of like, yeah. oh, they just hired someone to like do all this stuff. But it's like, no, we, we have, uh, we have local talent and we're, you know, we're doing it. So, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So you're saying like, you know, so you're from Kuwait, but you're saying like if someone else came in, they might think like some, someone else is just doing this and somebody just cut a big check or something. It's like, no, that's not yeah, the case. Yeah, yeah we made pretty it much. here. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, and we've actually had a few people like ask us that whenever we deployed, like, oh, hey, would you buy, would you buy this from? Like, no, we, we made it. Like, we didn't buy it from anywhere. That's like, awesome. Um, so it, it was kind of an offensive at first, but also kind of kind of cool eventually when we realized like like yeah we're we're blowing their minds that we're actually like we did actually build this you know that's really cool do you guys um, like ever do i mean i would emphasize that right if if that's something you know you're really proud of that subverts expectations like do you guys ever do like manufacturing like shop floor tours or any of that stuff like here's yeah, where we're machining uh, parts for robots and you know, yeah, we have we, have we don't anodize them here, the but you know, right down the street, you know, there that guy over there is anodizing our parts, and then it goes back on the robot. Yeah, yeah, uh, we have people coming all the time. Um, there's quite a few. Like, um, it was always kind of weird, but we we'd had like some celebrities come through every once in a while because they'd go to the museum, which is right next door. Just picturing Will Smith. Um, I haven't seen Will Smith there, but um, what was her name like? Naomi, that's supermodel, that's super tall. I don't think I would know her. Um, Naomi something. I don't have like a working knowledge of supermodels. Yeah, I'm really bad with like models and actors and actresses and singers and stuff. But I know Will Smith Um, because Independence Day was a great movie. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, he's been he's been around a few times. Um, No, but we also had like um, we've had like. I wouldn't call them celebrities from for like you know the, the general people, but like engineering, I guess celebrities. Oh, those are those people. are more interesting to me. I mean, I'm a nerd. Yeah. Like who? Um, so Ishiguro Hiroshi, who created like an android of himself. Oh um, yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> you get to meet that guy. Yeah, he was he was there. Is um, he with a, with a delegation? He seems pretty weird, like as a person. I don't know what he's actually like in real life, but. Somebody... I mean, I feel like anyone. I feel like most people in the in the industry are pretty. Yeah, pretty that's weird. certainly true. <laughs> I um. Somebody, I don't know. I I haven't met him. He's probably a really good guy, but I I, I thought it was kind of funny. Somebody told me like, you know, a lot of times you'll try to get your robot out of the uncanny valley by you know making it look a little bit less like a human or. You know, you have to be really good if you're going to try to you know jump over the uncanny valley and. Um, make it, you know, like somehow convincing as a human, like uh, just incredibly challenging. And the way that that guy did it was he um, apparently just started acting more like the robot in his day-to-day life. And so <laughs> I don't know if that's actually true. I haven't met him, but that's, uh, that's that was the word on the street that, that somebody said to me. Yeah, I've met him, but like I don't know how he was like before – I mean that that was a while ago, right? Yeah. Like I was I was still in college when he when he built that. Yeah. Um, I want to say like 2008, maybe. Okay. Like 15 years ago. That sounds about right. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, it's kind of amazing yeah, he that there. he's still um, known for that. <laughs> like a 15 years ago thing. Yeah. Um, no, he's he's still pursuing it. Like he's he's been building more of them and like, um, sort of pushing them as. Uh, uh, he has a lot of weird creative uses for them. Oh, that's um, interesting. Yeah, like for heads of state to like give speeches, so they don't like have to worry about getting shot. <laughs> that <laughs> thing. That eh, seems a little overkill, but maybe. I mean, yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm just yeah, picturing. I remember the other. Oh, sorry, after you. I, I'm just I, I'm, he uh, they, he gave a presentation. I'm trying to remember like all the use cases, um, but I can't remember them off the top of my head. Yeah. 
But uh, I mean, I don't know, it's Japan. Um, I guess I should mention I'm half Japanese. But yeah. Like relevant, but yeah. Um, but yeah, Japan you, has a very you, different uh, Are you fluent in Japanese too? Or? I, I would say I'm like third grader fluent. No, that's about as good as I am at French. I, uh, if that um, even. I mean, I can... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I can I can have a conversation, and I'm aware of the different like formal, casual ways of speaking, but I'm just really crap at like maybe it's more my personality than the actual like knowledge of of Japanese, but like I'm really crap at like conveying formal formal versus casual versus um, like the right tone I should be using. Oh, that's interesting. So it's not even. So I can't say... After yeah, you. so I constantly just sound I constantly just sound like a like a like a dumb seven year old. <laughs> I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's cool. I, I'm still you know you got way more language skill than I do. So. Yeah, yeah I heard you tried to pronounce my last name a few times. No, 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 no. It's all right. I wanted to get it right, but you know, I mean, I fully acknowledge, like you know, I have like no arabic so yeah it's gonna, gonna yeah, it's, be it's wrong a, there, there's a lot but of i feel like it was that, less wrong um, than it was by the end <laughs> so. yeah those those improvements yeah. uh like yeah i'll give you that for sure <laughs> um granted my, my my coaching was kind of like more more candid than like helpful i feel your coaching was Probably hilarious like, so for for the um the A in the middle of uh, your last name, you were like, think of like Arnold Schwarzenegger going like, get to the chopper. <laughs> or like, I'm, that's a horrible Arnold Schwarzenegger impression. Ah. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, just that Arnold sound. Ah. Yeah. So for people listening, well, yeah, what, is, think... what is the actual correct pronunciation of your last name? Uh, it would be El All right. Yeah, I fucked that up pretty bad. Oh, <laughs> good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there, there, there's a lot of there's a lot of weird letters in Arabic that like it. I mean, so there's there's the the the, the stereotypical ones like the kha that like a lot of different languages also use. Yeah. Um, but there's there's other ones that just they only pretty much exist in Arabic, or if they do exist in other languages, they're not like very widespread languages, like ba and fa, and like there's other like kind of. I wouldn't say they're guttural, but it's just the you you make the airflow kind of in a way that you're not accustomed to. Yeah, it makes sense. I did I did think the parallel that you drew with like Scottish was interesting on that particular sound. Which I don't know. Yeah, I feel like I feel like with languages, like once once you go to that region of your throat, like there, there's gonna be more than one letter in your language, like that uses that area. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Makes sense. Yeah. Cool. Yep. Um, but yeah, I was saying about Japanese, like there, there's this weird. Uh, uh, I have this, I have this like weird, um, controversial, like fascination recently involving robotics, um, and uh, colonialism. Interesting. Uh, yeah, and it's it's very it's it's not very academic. I, I'm just kind of like very. How can that not be academic? <laughs> like. <laughs> I mean, it is, but like I haven't been like really diving into it. But, oh, I got you. Um, I got, it's pre-academic. Yeah, like I haven't really like bought books or like read like it, a lot of it has to do with media. So I haven't really been watching movies about it and stuff. Yeah. Um, but there's definitely a very different view of robotics in Japan versus like the U.S. Huh. or Western world. Um, because in Japan it's it's more about like a human esque. Like Japan's a very rigid society, and robots are there to kind of like humanize people, in a weird way. Wait, like a lot of the, a lot of Japanese media, like we're talking like old like fifties. So 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 my 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 uh, my, my time reference is is like post World War Two. Got it. Okay. Uh, so for 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 Japan, it was like, this weird. Um, Wait, so robots were part of Japanese culture in like post World War Two. Oh yeah, I did not know that. Okay, that's wild. Um, trying to think, like, what's it called? The Atom Boy. Did you ever watch that? Or not yet? Uh, it was a black and white it. like yeah. anime. Um, but it was about it's kind of Mega Man. Like, I feel like Mega Man was based on it, but it's about this yeah. like professor who like creates this Mega boy. Man. Uh, he couldn't have his he couldn't have a kid of his own, so he built a robot kid, and this robot kid kind of just embodies like childhood. Huh. But he's also a superhero. 
Interesting. So he's off like saving the world, but he's he's a very much like a a, a very innocent like kid. Um, like another Japanese anime is uh, Doraemon, which is um, never heard of. It's like this robot cat from the future. <laughs> That's cool. Um, who goes back in time and he's like super lazy and just like not. But you know he he's just this, this big cute robot. That but is, I mean, like, given the theme and Adam Boy, I'm guessing he probably also has some kind of superhuman abilities or like. Yeah, he flies and like shoots lasers, but like, yeah. but in a very like, but he does everything in a very childish way, you know. Yeah. Um, and I feel like it's it's a lot of like Japan trying to embrace like vulnerability after World War Two. That's interesting. And kind of like you know, to throw off this like violent, like kind of thing and. Uh, um. That actually yeah. makes a lot of sense, given like the shift of power and like some of the culture that was like in vogue, obviously during World War Two. Yeah, so, yeah, and I mean, like yeah. even Gundam, which is like you know, from, on the surface, it's like you know, big mecha robots that are like fighting in war. Yeah, uh, it's really just a soap opera that's like a very anti-war soap opera, and it's like, huh. super sad. Um, Do you have to like, watch it end to end to get that? Like I, Futurama, I watched, and I felt like I had to watch it from the beginning to the end to really understand it. But like, if you just watch oh, an episode, okay. it's fun. Yeah, with Gundam, like, I, I remember watching it as a kid. I don't remember which, like, series it was, but it was really boring for me because it was just it was just a soap opera about, like, you know, girls in fall in love with a guy, the yeah. guy has to go to war, he dies, and, like, she's, like, sad. And, oh, that's interesting. Um, yeah, I watched it as a kid, too. I, I never got super into it. I would kind of just watch it when my friends were watching it, like, out of sequence, but... Yeah, when the robots show up, it's, like, awesome, but then, like, yeah. most of the movie, it's kind of just this, so, this like, like... The drama, drama, yeah, of them having to fight a war. Yeah. Right, but I mean, like it's 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 um, like even in the robots that are built, they're they're very like you know they're like service robots. They're like robots that are meant to like, kind of um, because I feel like Japan has a very rigid social structure, and the robots are kind of there to like bring about this like childlike um like vulnerability innocence. Huh. So, but, I mean, which means uh, uh, they're, they're constantly personified, where, like, in the U.S., we don't really personify our robots. Maybe. I don't know. Right. It seems like some people do. Well, so, I'm, I'm thinking more in, in along media. So, here's here's my controversial thing. Um, so, in, in uh, so, one thing that, so, I've, I'm, I'm fascinated by colonialism, uh, being from, like, not the Western world. Um, and so, robot. The word robot comes from, I believe, a. Uh, I'm going to butcher history. I think it was Slovenian. Yeah, I'm trying to remember too. I. Novel. But it basically. Yeah, I, I is, should know this. You know, it's like one of the things they tell you at Carnegie Mellon. Yeah, but it's uh, it's basically it basically means slave, right? Yeah. And if you look at the old, because uh, I mean robots like we're we're like robotics is is shaped by science fiction. Right, it's it's one of the few fields where, like, instead of the field shaping science fiction, it's science fiction shaping the field. Yeah, like, we get all ideas of like manipulators and like all this, all the stuff that robots should be comes from science fiction. Which is fucking wild that we're now taking that and developing it into real technology, uh, and I guess we have been right. for a while. Yeah, but the terminology comes from sci-fi. You're saying like the idea of a manipulator is out of sci-fi. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I mean, that's wild. If you look at like. Well, I mean, like, robotics are old nerds, robots, like, like the way they, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, but my point is, like, if you look at the old robots from like the sixties and seventies, which is a period of decolonization, it gets really uncomfortable because you start looking. Oh, because like, that's you know, like when people were losing all their. But it really was post World War Two that everybody lost all their colonies, right? Like the British, British yeah, had yeah, fucking yeah. everything, and then they had to, you know, like they didn't have the money to hold any of that crap anymore, and you know the Nazis yeah. were, you know. Sort of hammering them. Yes, at I home. mean, if you look at like Rosie from the Jetsons, like she was very much a like servant in a household, and like yeah. if you look at, uh, huh, uh, even like Star Wars R two D two and C three PO, they're just like you know I'm your translator. Yeah, and then yeah, you're right. And like, then whenever like they're regarded by like Luke Skywalker in the original three, um, like he sort of regards them with like a little bit of sarcasm, you know, like C three PO, you know. Oh, whatever <laughs> so. yeah, like, yeah like you're 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 showing off a personality but we know you're not like human so you know yeah, get the fuck yeah whatever you fucking toaster you know like yeah, yeah pretty much 
Um, so it's just kind of a weird, like, I'm not drawing any conclusions. I'm just kind of pointing out this weird, like, hey, like, robots got really popular around this, like, That's interesting. And, Where the Japanese yeah. side is more like, you know, definitely personified, I guess, maybe not the right word, but, like, look to more for, like, inspiration about how people maybe could be or should be. Where, like, the, yeah, cause, the cause Western you can't, side you can't really is, have... like, rolling your eyes, like, you know, like, it's not really a person. Potentially. I mean, like, it definitely has changed um, recently, so I'm kind of like, more focused on, like, the like the original, like, robots in the media. Uh, I mean, you have, you have robots like Wally, who are very much not that. Like, yeah, that's, you know, that's personified AF. Yeah. Right, or, like, uh, how was that one? What was that one Disney, like, was, like, Something Hero Six or uh, like, Big Hero Six. I never watched that one, but apparently it's based off of uh, Atkinson's research. I heard. Oh really? Oh yeah, I remember hearing that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I never. Talking about Atkinson, like like CMU Atkinson. CMU Atkinson. Or... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I once. Well, uh, I don't want to get him in trouble. I. <laughs> I I was. Yeah. Yeah, I almost lost fingers because of the soldering iron when I was a kid. With a soldering iron? I had like one of, yeah, because I had one of because I, I didn't have a like I didn't have a soldering iron for electronics. I had a soldering iron for like pipes. Ha. Huh. Because I was just some I, I just picked it up from somewhere and like I didn't hold it by the handle, I held it by the heat guard. Oh fuck. Because I was like, so into like what I was soldering. Um this was like when You I was, picked like, it up by guard. the heat guard. Okay, I see. And then Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's wild. And like, didn't think about it until like, I brought it in front of my face because like, at that point, like, it just burnt my nose. There must have been like, oh, smoke. Shit. Yeah, at that like you must have seen the smoke before you felt the sensation. Uh, no, because I, I was bringing it up to my eyes, so like, I saw that I was holding it there, and I was like, oh shit, this is not, you know, how I'm supposed to hold it. Yeah. Because you know, it's like one of those like, like the handle's this big and like the iron's like this long because you're <laughs> meant to like. It's a caveman solder soldering like. iron. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, those are those are neat. I, I I like those ones. I bought an antique soldering iron. Actually, I bought two of them recently. Where it's you know how like there's that phrase about having all your irons in the fire. So like you know I've got a lot of irons in the fire or whatever. I, I always kind of wondered where that came from, until okay. I bought this antique soldering iron that it, it's just a giant slug of copper, and it had um, oh. like a little steel bit and then a wooden handle. And so the only way to use that would be to stick it in a fire, you know, huh. and then solder with it and then put it back in the fire to heat it up again. I think, you know, you rely on oh, like, the thermal the steel, mass. Yeah, is the steel supposed to, like, kind of contain the heat? I think and, the like, steel's meant to be, like, a copper? somewhat of a heat insulator, and then the wood's meant to really okay. be a heat insulator. And then the copper's meant to just, like, hold on to heat. And so you throw the chunk of copper in the fire, I'm guessing. I've not actually read the instruction manual. And it I would assume up. that it would be the. Uh, I assume that would be the uh, the steel that would like retain the heat, and uh, the copper would dissipate it. Yeah, but, I don't know. I'm not. A, well, the I'm steel a, was only uh, there for like like at least in this like it was like steel wire basically, and then this giant like you know like you know two centimeter cube of copper with like a point on one end of it like a little pyramid, and so um, that giant like relatively large chunk of copper. Um, we're, we're totally going to have some guy in like your comment section just like calling us idiots. And, yeah, like, he's like, that's not how you use it at all. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, yeah. the wooden end goes in your nose, <laughs> the copper end. <laughs> that's not for soldering. That's for <laughs> sealing letters. A screwdriver, you idiot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so the colonization robots thing is still interesting to me because I know it's like less technical, but it's... Oh, and then... I, I also burned myself with a soldering iron when I was a kid, but I was trying to teach my sister how to solder, and I was pointing to a junction, and she just poked my finger with the soldering iron and burned me. <laughs> so. Of course that was accidents. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, oh. But anyway, so, like, how does the colonization piece come in, uh, if I can get back into that? I'm just kind of curious. Uh, I guess more of the decolonization. Um so I'm I'm a huge like board game nerd and yeah. uh, I I play all sorts of like board games from that era. Um, most of it's just kind of like trading type of games, but also like 1950s and too. 60s. Uh, yeah. Um, I don't know. That whole like time period is really fascinating. Like like because there's decolonization happening. There's Cold War. Um, 
there's the whole Arab nationalist movement that was happening in this region. Um, all of that is just like intertwined with each other in various ways. Um, so I've been reading a lot about it because like, so much of it gets um, uh, romanticized. Yeah. Until you actually read history and it's like, okay, like here are the actual facts of what was happening on the ground. Yeah, it's, it's a, it, was, it was a weird, uh, weird time. Um, but yeah, that's kind of how it got. Then robots kind of got into it, right? Because that's also around the time that robots became a thing in media. So that would be the early 50s um, in media. Yeah. Like, I mean, yeah. They, they weren't I mean, really they've been around since like the 20s. But, huh. um, you know, like, media really started like exploding after World War, after World War II, during the Cold War when like... So when you, know, you say the 20s, are you and... talking about like the Mechanical Turk or something like that? Or are you talking about something? Um... I'm trying to remember because I, w- I was kind of really quickly reading about it, but like I didn't actually watch any of these movies uh, for me to actually give a critique or like a an academic like analysis of it. Um, I just knew that they existed in the 20s. How influential they are today, probably not. I mean, I mean, you know, they, they, there's like cascading with series of you know this influences that. Yeah. Um, but you know, like when we think of robotics today, like the earliest memory is like you know, Lost in Space, or like you know, the the Star Wars robots, or um, yeah, and that's like seventies uh, era, Jetson. yeah, yeah, sixties. Uh, I think wasn't Lost in Space in the fifties. Lost in Space might have been the fifty. I, I'll be honest, I, I only watched like the uh, the like two thousand twenties like remake of it. I, I didn't actually watch the original, yeah. but that was pretty good. Yeah. I think another reason I really got into that is like, we, I mean, you know, we studied robotics, but like, it, it is a sort of a weird thing where if you look at academia, like it's still very much influenced by science fiction, right? Like people trying to recreate the T-1000 from Terminator. Wait, people are doing uh, that? I mean, it's it's like an influence of theirs, right? Like, like I've seen papers where they're trying to create robots that like, you know, nanorobots robots that like, you know, shape like liquid nanorobot type of stuff. Oh, that's interesting. Um, it's, it's, like, it's, it's highly academic, right? Like you know, you're never you're never going to see yeah. a use case in real life anytime soon. Yeah. Um, but like everything we use is coming out of these uh, research um, projects, and yeah. these research projects are just a bunch of nerds watching sci-fi movies. But like, hey, that's cool. <laughs> let's, let's try doing that. Oh, we try know? making one of those. The other one I thought was interesting that I've only ever seen in academics, and I don't know that there's going to be a practical application for a while, but, like, the machine that can manufacture itself. Right? There's, like, that sci-fi thing with the paperclip factory that everyone – I haven't read it, but, like, it, I've had it referenced okay. to me. And um, okay. the idea is, like, this thing has to make paperclips, and it's got some artificial intelligence, and – it wants to make paper clips. However, it can make paper clips, and eventually, it ends up like taking apart planets and people and stuff to make paper clips. And yeah, that's so, the other thing. ChatGPT, like the, the recent like obsession with AI, like yeah. ChatGPT and regenerative AI and stuff. Like that was another thing because it's like, like for me, I'm like, why are we doing this? Yeah, I don't see a point in it, but you know, that's from my perspective. But people are excited about it because most people's interaction with robotics is. Like sci-fi. Well, I mean, people and, definitely know, have... conflate AI and robotics a lot. Like that's kind of. I'm sure you deal with this too, especially yeah, you know. Very much. Yeah. Um, where people just think we're, robotics we're highly, and AI are um, the same thing. I mean, they're very. Real. I mean, especially at, like in CMU, that they, it was it was taught side by side. Yeah. Well, and, and and they like are. They're... Yeah, I guess you're right. And I mean, and they are pretty interrelated. And. There, well, it also depends on what you define as AI. And it also depends how you're using AI. I mean, because, like, I don't know, like, ChatGPT is not a robot, but, like, you know, I don't but know. But robots use A-star, and A-stars and yeah. artificial intelligence. Wait, algorithm. A-stars? Would you consider A-star artificial? Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's that's making a decision. Yeah, no, right? that's true. Would you consider, like, an auto-tuning PID control to be artificial intelligence? Hmm. Maybe I mean it's it's already well defined, right? Like these these are all kind of marketing terms. What about Dijkstra's algorithm? Is that considered to be artificial intelligence? Um, I'm gonna say yes, just because it was taught in my artificial intelligence course. Interesting. Okay. 
uh, but it's making me question that as well. I just I just don't know, right? Like yeah. I, I I guess you're right. That's like a definition issue. Is like what really is AI and like. I yeah. got it in um, when I was a computer science student. Um, we had like a, I think it was like a graph theory course or data structures mm -hmm. and algorithms analysis. It might have been, and and I just yeah, they went through some classic algorithms and breadth first search, depth first search, Dijkstra's algorithm. Uh, although my professor pronounced it Dijkstra's algorithm, he was from the Soviet Union. I still don't know what the right pronunciation is. Uh, yeah, but um, I've heard Dijkstra's and Dijkstra's. Um, and then is it like Fanuc? I think it's Fanuc versus people say Fanuc. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I'm not familiar with them. I know yeah, I, it's a I Japanese uh... industrial arm company. They're huge. Okay. They make those yellow robots. They're like, they're like definitely in the Fortune 500. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm not pretty sure. I, I put money in. I'm really, I'm really bad with. I'm really bad with manipulators. I'm, I just never. Yeah. I, I know. Uh, I know Kuka, and that's about it. No, it, like it's. So it's like a KUKA competitor, but like um, their robots are distinctive because they're like this canary yellow color. Um, okay. And so like that's like ABBs are like either orange or white, depending on when it was made. Theirs are yellow. Uh, KUKA's, I think, orange. Um, maybe because, they have some yeah, black like... ones. But um, I don't uh, know. And I, I know you told me not to look, not to like look up stuff, but I, I, I got very... Uh... Curious. All good. Okay. So if Actually, you're I'm glad, I'm glad this came up because I got to call uh, my Fanuc rep at some point for a project today. So, so if you're interested in uh, the Japanese pronunciation, it's Fanaku. Fanaku. So neither one. Is, is, yeah, is, is how it's but closer out to Fanuc uh, than Fanuc. Fanaku. Cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm. I'm guessing you probably pronounce it that way to. So it doesn't sound like you're uh, cursing. Wait, is there like a swear word that's very similar in Japanese? No, but just fanaku. Just I don't know. Just oh, I got it. Like, like it it's kind of like fuck you. Know. Kind of. Yeah. A little, like the way it's written. Yeah. Um. Change it for the U.S. market. That makes sense. Yeah, Japanese uh, names and acronyms are never what you. Uh, it's 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 those. It's company names that I know are interesting, but when you tell a, like, if there's always like a, oh, huh, like type of uh, thing in English. Um, like Mitsubishi means three three diamonds. That's interesting. What's Mitsubishi the, is literally just three diamonds. Mitsubishi. What's the uh, historic significance? I guess, yeah, their logo reflects that. What's the, yeah. um, why did, did they just name it that? Because they need just generic company name or like, was uh, there like that some I don't significance know. to it? Um, that I'm not sure. It yeah. might be a family thing. Um, Probably, I, right? I mean, that seems like... I'm going to try not to look at... I'm, no not, I'm going to try not to look at Wikipedia. I can't but, remember um, what the name for it is, but it does seem like a lot of those Japanese companies are like just giant family conglomerates from like over the years. Yeah, that's that's kind of how it uh, how it started. Um, so my favorite Japanese company is Bridgestone. Bridgestone is Japanese? Yeah, and see, yeah, so it worked. Um, the, <laughs> the the family, the family that made Bridgestone tires yeah. is uh, Ishibashi, yeah, which in Japanese literally means Bridgestone. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So they named it Bridgestone back in like the uh, I think eighties, um, or. I'm not sure. Like some sometime like before Japan was kind of like famous, you know, before Japan like had a reputation for making really uh, good because they shit, wanted yeah. something. Yeah, because they wanted something that sounded Western, so that people would trust it more. That's interesting. That's really so they just took they just took the guy's last name and just literally translated it to English. Um, actually, it would technically be Stone Bridge. It wouldn't even be Bridgestone. It would like the the, the name means Stone Bridge. But that probably sounded like not as cool as Bridgestone. Oh, but the so. ordering, but the ordering is um, actually no, no. The ordering is Ishibashi Stone Bridge. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, yeah, I guess, I guess, I guess, ordering it made it sound more like, oh yeah, this sounds like a you know a fine British company, Bridgestone. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, it worked. It yeah. Worked on me. Yeah, and going back to like going back to the whole like post-colonialist uh, time yeah. period. 
Yeah, that's really interesting. I asked you about the um, DeBay Future Labs, uh, some of the robots right. you're working on, but then we got more into like you know the fact that it's all made in DeBay, which is pretty cool too. Um, and then, um, yeah, it almost sounds like kind of like uh, you know how here in Pittsburgh we've got the National Robotics Engineering Center. Yeah, it seems like a similar mentality similar. over there where you guys are trying to do it all yourselves and like vertically integrate. Yeah, so we're 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 way like we we have a pretty decent budget, but like we're way smaller of a player. We don't have like a you know world class university like backing us as much. Um, so we're just kind of rolling with what we got. Um, yeah. not to say like you know we have we have, we have some pretty pretty impressive people working there. Um, so That's like awesome. that was I, I I wouldn't be working there if like. I didn't feel like, you know, confident. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, 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 I think it is, it does kind of tie into this, right? Because one of my frustrations is the, um, like the direction, because, you know, we're a robotics lab, we're trying to build robots. And in all the companies I've worked for, it was, we're trying to deliver a solution and robots are a means of delivering that solution. Yeah. And well, here, I mean, that's pretty much every job I get. Yeah, um, but I feel like here we're we're trying to like focus on robotics. So we want robotics to be something that we um, develop a skill set in, and are able to like begin delivering projects, um, utilizing that skill set. Yeah. Um, and I I think my some of my frustrations is like there's a lot of uh, I want to say inflated demand for robots that fit the sci-fi narrative of the 60s huh rather because you know like is that coming there's, from there's the museum or is that more like we're... no that's that's a general international thing like you know you huh. think about like delivery robots right like yeah, why yeah. do we need delivery yeah. robots people can do that yeah people have been doing a, a fine job of it yeah uh, like why do we need robots to deliver stuff when there's a guy who will gladly take the job and he costs way less than a bunch of PhDs trying to figure out how to like make this damn thing turn. Well, it's a matter of unit economics, right? Like the PhDs are expensive like the first time, but you do it yeah. like a billion times and you know, maybe it's cheaper right. with the robots. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of like taking a jab at the industry that we're like working in and like threatening our like, <laughs> positions but I think there's a lot of cool things that robots nah, can do that humans can't do yeah. right or or that they can do better than humans yeah and i feel like that's because it doesn't exist like pe we we don't really want like try for that that makes sense i feel like people are comfortable oh interesting robots. do you have any idea like, people like... Are comfortable watching uh like robots do human tasks knowing that their job is not at stake Versus watching a robot do something that they can't do that, like they'll do better than us in. So give me an example of like a like a robot only task that like a person just wouldn't be capable of. Um, microsurgery, or like not a microsurgery, but like like really precision surgery. So what about like right? vicarious surgical? Right? Aren't they working on something like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's there's a lot of like but fear around that, right? Yeah. Like well, people are like, hey, what if a really? robot? I mean, it's still human I mean, teleoperated, though. Like, you've still got, like, a surgeon running the sure. robot. Sure. Uh, driverless, car, or like driverless cars. Yeah, but people can drive. Like, that's not, that's a person job that you're just giving to a robot. But, but they can't drive for 48 hours straight. That's a good point. Yeah, that's true. And, you know, like, truck drivers are kind of, like, concerned about that or offended by it, right? Because it's, it's their jobs that are at stake. Yeah, and that's like their whole thing is being able to like ingest caffeine and like you know get across you know the around here would be like you know like if you can drive from like you know the east coast of the United States the west coast of the United States and you know like however many I think there's like limits though I think you have to you know like sleep every X number of hours or every X number of like miles or right. whatever. The robots don't have to, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. That would be stupid. Yeah. Versus like. Versus like barista robots, where like no one's going to argue against a barista robot. You don't think there's like a barista's lobby that's pissed off about barista robots? Yeah, but they know that like a robot can't do a like 
can't do a better job. I mean, you know, who, you're going to talk to a robot about your problems when you get your coffee in the morning. It's <laughs> <laughs> pretty funny. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's kind of the robot bartender thing, right? Like, I mean, I'm, you know, I don't know. It's the same thing, right? It's like you can't talk to. Yeah, exactly. Or yeah. A robot making bread or like any kind of service robot. Like, I feel like, you know, like you said, I mean, there's there's a great human element. And like, you know, if I go to a restaurant and I'm trying to get, you know, a meal, like part of that is because I want to get out of my house and interact with humans. You know, it's like if I. Yeah. It was a totally sterile experience and, you know, like a robot just brought a thing and I was in this isolated booth, you know, it's like I could have just done this at home. Yeah, I could have just gone and delivered. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I'm, I but, don't know. Uh, like, I'm kind of weird. Like, I don't I don't like getting things to, like, if I go out, I want it to be about the experience and, like, if I'm home, like, I like cooking, so I'm like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make some stuff. Yeah. So. And yeah. occasionally a friend will, will talk me into the ordering delivery, but I try not to. I mean, there's plenty of stuff you can't make that, or just restaurants to do better. Well, so there is one dish I like tried to nail when I was an undergrad, like, and I, I probably did like seven iterations on it, like trying to like get it as good as the restaurant, and just couldn't nail it. But other than that, um, I feel like I'm I'm pretty good at getting my head around stuff. <laughs> and, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, wait, I had a point here. With sorry, yeah, yeah. Now I'm off the rails. It's all good. We're, we're going to be doing this all night. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, I don't know. I, I just feel like... Hey, speak for yourself. It's afternoon over here. <laughs> yeah, true. Uh, uh, but I feel like there's a lot of opportunities for like robots to do things that humans can't do. And a lot of that is kind of creativity of, like, what can't we do? Why do we need to do them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Well, I mean, um, maybe like, some of the stuff lot... you see in, like, industrial automation, right, is is, like being able to sort garbage at like a massive scale with like pneumatic blow offs and, and do it efficiently. Yeah. But that's, yeah, that's a lot of that's for just for show though. I mean, yeah, yeah day, that's a good point. Show. Like it's still not really economical. Like they show robots doing that. And it's like, is this really what you're doing when the cameras aren't on? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean like I'm, I'm kind of surprised by like the sheer number of like delivery robot companies out there from like all different like countries in the world. Um, and just like, like that one to me kind of makes sense, but I, I didn't mean to cut you off, Mishari. Sorry. No, it's fine. Um, no, it just seems like we, we have a lot of, uh, people like we're, we're what I I lost track. Are we 7 billion, 8 billion? I think we're like, I think we're around 8 billion, but don't, don't quote me on that. Yeah. And I mean, like we have a lot of people and like, there's a, general like you know we have have tough economic times and like most of the people on this earth are like unskilled um like do we really need robots to replace those guys you know that like i think it's the only job they can get and you know it's not not really high value i mean like even if you're a complete asshole and like don't care about like human like (laughs) humanity like like they're willing to work for way cheaper than a robot yeah doing deliveries or doing whatever you know whatever we're using robots to do but again um, I, I think the vision is like to be able to get the robot so it's cheaper than them like i think that's that's the optimization that yeah all these delivery companies that have billions of dollars of funding into them are trying to to hit is like how do we make it cheaper than that guy like over you know large numbers yeah. of deliveries because you're not going to do it like Delivery one, like, hey, we got there, you know, and like you're funded for like eight hundred billion dollars. It's like, here's your pizza. <laughs> you know? like, yeah, there's, yeah, there's no way, you know. But but, but here, here's where I got back to the whole like post colonial thing because like, do we do we need this, or do we just want this because we watched the Jetsons? Oh, oh, oh. Kids. Well, we certainly you don't know? need it. Um, I, I will agree with you with that. I mean. Want, yes. Need, no. But, I mean, when you really get down to what we need, I mean, you know, food, water, shelter, right? Like, you know, I mean. Yeah. Which, there's a fucking shortage of all three of those things. Nah, (laughs) touche. Yeah. I mean, there's robots that work in construction. (laughs) Say again. 
and like you know taking those jobs taking jobs away from these people aren't, isn't going to help their uh, you know food shelter and uh, like yeah water like situation um yeah i could see that i mean yeah, i don't know i guess there's like arguments now for like universal basic income and you know like ways to sort of offset that by you know but are we really going to do that like i don't know you know <laughs> so yeah and just because so we can like, doesn't uh, mean we will. I know we're segueing, but also like sure. I feel sometimes we we actually um, do go back to earlier conversations. Uh, so, uh, so I used to work for for Blue Belt. Yeah. And one thing one thing I really liked about working for Blue Belt was the fact that we created the system that takes a mediocre surgeon and give him or her uh, this this robotic suite. That allows them to perform surgeries way more accurate, um, way more efficiently than you would normally be able to. Yeah. Um, and I kind of like that perspective of like using robots to enhance people. Yeah, for sure. You know, some more more Iron Man rather than R two D two. Yeah, that's that's an um, interesting analogy there. Because then you can take skilled or unskilled people that there is an abundance of. Um, in, you know, in this world, and give them a system that makes them more skilled, right? So they're still making a job. They still have. They still have pay. They're. They might not get paid as much as you know, um, like someone who is of that skill set. But now you're you're taking. I know, like I'm, I'm, I'm treating humans like 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 they're like resources. But I'm, you know, I need that perspective, right? Because yeah. those are people that like run this world, not. Not like people that actually care about human human humanity. Um, ah, it's probably less black and white than that, uh, I would think. But yeah, anyway. Yeah. So. Uh, but I mean, you know, like you're taking a, you're taking a resource that is available and very affordable, uh, which is humans, and you're basically improving them to perform more skilled tasks. Wait, are you saying that if you took the blue belt technology like to its logical extreme, then like someone like you or I that's not trained as a surgeon could do a surgery? Um, maybe surgery is a bit extreme, but for example, rather than self-driving cars, maybe we could create just really awesome like monitoring systems in cars but yeah. never still drive. Well, I think we're, we're doing that, right? Like... Yeah, yeah. So I, I, think, I think that's more that's more feasible. That's more financially... Um, yeah, that was like it's more financially feasible. We don't rock the boat as much. People still have their jobs. People have we have more jobs because now we have other guys who are maintaining these systems. Yeah, um, and uh, I think that's sort of the way that we. Uh, that was like, like Ford and sort of VWs. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, it's okay. I was gonna say that seems to have been Ford and VW's whole argument for like disbanding uh, Argo. You know, it was like <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 Um, but yeah, I mean, like, the, the, and there's a lot, of, a lot of opportunities for that. Like, we as humans have senses that work for what we used to do as like hunter gatherers and stuff. But um, we have all these like cool sensors, like lidar, that we are only using on robots, and like we are not um, giving humans the opportunities to, you know, do things with lidar. Doesn't that make sense? Hasn't Apple been putting lidar into their iPhones though for several years? Like I've not been following super close what they're doing with it, but I remember like when okay, I was yeah. buying my iPhone 12. Um, that's that I still have because I'm not upgrading until I need to. Oh yeah, um, I do remember. Yeah, I do, I do remember. But yeah, like, there was like an it, option right? to get lidar in it. Yeah, I'm like, I, huh? I don't think I need lidar in my phone, but. Interesting to know that I could have it for like only you know a couple hundred bucks or whatever it was. Right, but I mean, we could do something with that, right? Like, yeah, or I don't know. Like, I feel like the augmented reality comes to mind is like what they might have been yeah, trying to yeah. to position that for. Maybe maybe it works really well, and I just never ran the demo, so I, I haven't seen it personally yet. But I mean, yeah, that that would have been like you know. What like three years ago that phone was like a thing, so that means there's been three years of additional, you know, like market data capture and you know, 
engineering uh, engineering work on making the technology better, which probably feeds back into the, I mean, I don't know if you've been following, I, I certainly haven't been closely following it, but like the Apple, um, what, like those glasses they came out with recently, like um, the, uh, oh, the virtual yeah, reality. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've only offering. followed it through memes and like. Yeah, pretty much same. Like parodies. Uh, but yeah. uh, that's good for them. I don't know. I can't really take it much. I can't really take Apple seriously though. Whenever they release like new hardware. Yeah. Well, but I mean, how do you mean? Like, to to what extent? Like, I I kind of. Uh, the whole like uh, what do you call them? AirPod thing was kind of like a weird like. Oh, wow. Well, hey, new feature. You removed something. What the? Like, what did they remove? Like 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 the, like the microphone jack. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> I mean, I've been a long time Android user, and I'm just yeah. kind of like annoyed that I can't like all these headphones that I have are now like not compatible with my phone. Ah, uh, that's annoying. So I was an Android and, like, user yeah, yeah. until I had a Pixel 4a um, just sort of uh, it malfunctioned while I was on a call with a client um, and power cycled and then after my next meeting I took it out of my pocket and the screen was cracked all the way down the middle so I think what had happened is there was a flex circuit that was bent over itself that like oh. contacted like a some kind of a metal element like you know if it was like foil or a heat sink or the chassis I think the chassis was plastic though so it might have been one of the other things but I, I think there was a short battery swelled cracked the screen from the inside um, I, I contacted support. They're like, this is your fault. So I'm like, well, I'm just going to buy an Apple phone now. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's when I, when I've done, I started I've buying those. So many of those. I've done so many of those passive aggressive uh, decisions in my life. And I don't remember why I'm like so militant against or for anything anymore. Yeah, for sure. And I'm kind of similarly stubborn. I'll cut off my nose to spite my face. Yeah. I mean, that's what it was. Yeah, like the Apple phone was so much more expensive, right? I, I got like a fifteen hundred dollar phone instead of a four hundred dollar phone, uh, you know, yeah. and like begrudgingly so. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, augmentation. Like I feel, I feel that I feel like because robotics is a field and it's called robotics, we focus on robots. But robotics also encompasses this, you know, like sensors, user experience uh human augmentation and we're not i'm not sure why we're not focusing on it but i feel like that is sort of a, a really important thing for us to, to focus on yeah 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 and i don't disagree i mean like the way that my job works is typically my company just works on the technical side of whatever project so I guess my brain, I haven't been developing the muscles as much of thinking of like, what should we be working on as much as like, how do I solve this problem? But, you know, it's, that's interesting. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I'm definitely a big fan of human augmentation and, and we've certainly done some cool work in the prosthetic space and, uh, you know, medical robots and things that help people and you feel good yeah. working on that stuff. Oh yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah. It's so. way more uh, rewarding than like, you know, your, your typical like moving robot. I, I don't know. It, yeah, the moving it was, ones it was really are cool rewarding, too, but yeah, yeah. But it's kind of cool. Like, um, I've actually met people who've had um, in-laws um, or like like relatives um, who performed a sur who like received a surgery using the the system that we built. Oh, that's cool. Like the Navio. And uh yeah, yeah. Nice. Um and yeah, there, there's this certain level of pride of like I help someone I know walk again. Nice. Like it's, it's a very cool uh it's it's really 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 fulfilling like it, it really like made me realize like yeah, this path that I took is uh yeah, it's it's, it's worth it. Yeah, you know? for sure. And you do feel good working on stuff like that. Um, like I said, yeah, I, that's that's completely awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think we need more of that. Yeah. I don't know. I'm I'm just sort of going off of uh, going off of my little personal tangent. Yeah, no, no, it's all good. Um, 
I mean, obviously, like I, I too would like to work on more projects like that. It's just you know they don't always come around. So, but yeah. I don't know, maybe, maybe the solution is you know like Mashari and Spencer's like Medical Robot Incorporated, and <laughs> yeah, or I mean I don't know like robots are cool in media, right? But like all that other stuff isn't as cool. Like yeah. I don't know. I feel like there, there's there's generally a push from society or from like. Um, I, I mean, maybe not society, but like communities to kind of like define robots as like these are robots. You know, a robot will drive someone or something, or like a robot will build something for you. Um, and there's not as much of a. I don't know, this goes into the whole like media thing of like, you know, RTD2 versus Iron Man. Yeah, you know, yeah like, why sense. is Iron Man just one guy? Like, why, why can't we have like multiple suits and like, I, I don't know, just just. Oh, uh, that's interesting. Um, yeah. That's really interesting. Why doesn't everyone just get yeah. an Iron Man suit? I think there was, wasn't there like, wasn't that the plot to like one of the Iron Man movies where like the military is trying to make an Iron Man suit and it's like, and give them to everyone and like Iron Man's got his Iron Man suit and like. I don't know. I I kind of stopped yeah. watching Marvel movies a while ago because they just got like a little bit too dependent on yeah. special effects i thought i never got into it but i just i knew it was something that people relate to yeah, yeah for sure no, yeah. no i mean I, they're kind of fun i mean like i don't know the first iron man movie i thought was good like there were some interesting themes like the guy getting kidnapped and then like almost blowed up by like a bomb that has his company's logo on it you know i thought that was kind of a fun scene and so Right. He like rethinks what he's doing, you know. It's like, do I really want to be building, you know, bombs, you know, basically? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I mean, I don't know. Like that, 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 that's. Uh, I don't know. Sci-fi has a really big effect on what we do. Like the the general, um, uh, attitudes that people have towards our profession is very much sci- like the attitudes people have toward a profession for sure, are driven by sci-fi, right? Like. Yeah, that's interesting. Like, yeah, you know, like a lot of people are afraid of humanoid robots, I think, because they saw the Terminator. And so, you know, it's like. But your point is interesting. A lot of people are trying to build a robot because they saw the Terminator. Yeah, I mean, pretty much like, yeah, it's kind of like that. That's expectation, right? Like it's um, like engineers do cool things and we build cool things. But at the end of the day, like it's funded by. uh people that you know want something in particular and um i've had a lot not 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 just my current job but like in previous jobs where like uh we have marketing departments that want our robot to be a certain way or do a certain thing because that's how they perceive uh people's reactions would be or or they they perceive people's reaction to be a certain way based on like the like the what's the one word just just thought that 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 the word of like the way people perceive like the the way that people perceive robots like culturally is that i'm not sure if that applies here i i I, but i don't have a deep enough understanding of what what gestalt refers to to give an informed decision one way or the other but you're saying like knowing like the application like when they see the thing basically like or just like people's expectations of the thing, or like what. Um, I brought this up earlier, like the, uh, like you know, back in the day, it was, it was Rosie, yep. Jetsons, like that's what robots should be like. Then there's Terminator, and now there's a whole lot of like Wally, like slash like, uh, Big Hero Six type of robots that are like fuzzy and comfortable. Cute. Yeah. Um. And then I guess and, if like, you look at like. Those, Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, I just kind of paused and because I had nothing else to say, and I'm pretending like I had something else to say. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> I don't feel bad then. So I was gonna say, like, um, I feel like there's QT. It's easier to make a QT market. Like, I don't know if Big Hero Six, and I didn't see Big Hero Six, so I can't really speak to it that much. But like Wally, like, I don't know. I mean, have you seen the Amazon Astro yet? Uh, I have not. It's reminiscent of Wally. Um, it's I think the early adopter price was like fifteen hundred dollars, um, but for that price, I mean, 
the thing's got like a lot of sensing uh, and compute, um, and it's probably doing a lot of stuff on the internet too. Um, but like, some of my friends just got one, and it'll it'll run around their house, and like, you know, like there's a tablet, and it's uh, able to pivot side to side and look up, uh, and then I think it has stereo cameras on the front of the tablet. Um, and then there's a little periscope above the tablet that um, is able to go up like four or five feet. And then that's got stereo cameras on it and then illumination, LEDs. And then it's got um, a base which has like maybe like 20 centimeter diameter wheels that are like canted at like, I don't know, uh, probably like a 10 degree angle. Um, and it's uh it's really cute like they they like the geometry of the face is really basic so there's like circles for eyes and then it has like little lines that will use like eyebrows to like emote different things and then i mean the voice that it uses is like it's just like squeaks and makes beeping noises like as it's going around um and i i it almost kind of seems like a combination like replacement for like a dog or a cat but then also like, um, you know, did I leave my stove on with that st- with that periscope? So, like, if you're, like, oh. out of town and, yeah, you want to, like, look up, it can, like, extend the periscope and, like, look at things that are human height. Um, or, like, you know, I mean, I think they market it partially as, like, a security robot. So, you know, like, if somebody breaks into your house, like, you, you have video of them doing it or whatever. Um, but- and then it's also uh, integrates to Amazon Alexa. So you can like ask it questions and it's kind of weird cause it's got that cutesy persona for like most of what it does when it goes around and it'll do like little dances and stuff. But then when you, uh, when you ask it anything, it just breaks into Alexa's voice and starts answering you. <laughs> it's like, it's like the split personality. So that's kind of, that's kind of a little bit uh, off putting, but yeah. you, know, you can also understand why they did it. Cause I mean, I'm sure to make another, you know, voice or whatever would be a lot of money and, I guess that kind yeah, of breaks. What's that? Yeah, and it breaks the, um, you know, the like non-articulate, uh, like uh, you know, just animal, um, you know, vibe that they're going for of like squeaks and beeps and, you know, acting like a cat or a dog, and so. R two D two. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. So like, yeah, that's it's it's like. Well, RTD2 is also cute, I guess. It's, it's, yeah, it's kind of like, it's kind of cute. Like, that's, it's, it's party piece is being cute. And then you can. Yeah, a lot of like rounded edges and. Yeah, yeah, very rounded edges. Um, it's, it's more angular than R2D2, I would say. Um, like with the, like the 10 degree cant on the wheels and then like, you know, but like it's probably like one centimeter fillets like on corners and stuff like that. So, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of neat. Um, and that, I guess that gets more to like that type of, you know, service robot aesthetic, uh, but then also like kind of a pet. And it, it's neat. Like if it's not doing anything, it'll like, it'll just hang out with you. So it'll like pop into like the room where the people are. And like, it'll kind of have these oh. spots it prefers around the house. So it'll like sit in one place. And then it'll, you know, like on the screen, it'll be like going to hang out. And then it like goes and finds all the people and then like we'll like perch there right. and kind of just move the face around and like look up, you know, and I don't know. I, I feel like they, they sort of did a good job making it adorable. But it's kind of not the most useful thing like functionally either. Right. Like you could use it to transport a beverage basically. Like there's like a cup holder, I think, on the back and. It has a function where it can find a particular person. So if you're like, find yeah. Mashari, it'll like look for your face in particular and like stop when it finds you. Can't really use like find keys or anything. No, but I could send you a Coca Cola from a different room. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely, uh, I mean, I get, I mean, it sells, but yeah, we, we, I don't know. I guess it's just frustrating when, like, I feel like robotics is one of the more difficult, um, like, disciplines out there for you to like get into, and to 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 realize you're just here for like entertainment. It's, it gets a little frustrating. 
Yeah, that's fair. I mean, I don't know. Entertainment's cool, though. Like, I used to... I think one of the original things I wanted to do when I was trying to, like, find my robotics niche was um, I really liked, you know, like, um, the giant puppets from, like, the Pink Floyd concerts and stuff, and I thought it would be fun to work on some sort of entertainment robotics. You know, I found out later there's no money in that, so it's not really what I'm doing now, but... I mean, there is just you gotta do it through like Amazon, right? Yeah, but well, so it that type of like home entertainment. I I don't know how big the market for that really is. Like, I kind of wonder if that's more. Like, I'm guessing they're selling those at a loss based on the amount of sensors and and actuators and the production quantities. I could be wrong. Yeah. It's just my gut telling me that. Um, I mean, Nito uh, was it Nito that went out of business recently? Yeah, they, but that's a robotic vacuum, right? That's got a functional purpose. But were they better than actual vacuums? Yeah, now that I don't know. So, like, one of my friends had a good a good take on it, which I really liked, which is, like, you know, the Roomba is, like, a crappy vacuum cleaner, but it does a way better job than I don't do. Yeah. You know, and so... Something to be said for that. Yeah. Like, even if it's not Although perfect. Although, I, I... Yeah. I always had long hair, so like my uh, my Roomba in college just totally just shut the bed. Like, <laughs> the first week that I got it, that's pretty uh, awesome. Just didn't have like the didn't really have the uh, the the power to like get through all the hair that I shed. <laughs> well, see, I don't have that problem. I uh, I'm very bald, so. Uh, but it's you feature. know, I would say my cat keeps my Roomba busy. Um, Although right now, like my place is such a mess, I can't even run my Roomba because like there's too many obstacles on the floor. Yeah, just like have to have to clean up pairs of shoes and stuff, which you know, a little embarrassing, but is is what yeah, it but is. Now, yeah, I'm just I'm just thinking about like my Roomba experience where it was the same thing where like I'm I'm sitting there just like babying a robot to make sure that like there's that one table that always gets stuck underneath, so I have to like create a little like barrier to like it doesn't get stuck into the table. I had like, a couch; mine would get wedged under because like it had yeah. like a, a slant, and so That's perfect. Yeah, exactly, and and there was no way for the sensors on the ones they were making at the time to perceive that, so it would just wedge itself in there and then get stuck. Yeah, that was just it was just bumpers back then, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I think there's like some the one I've got had like some other stuff like i think they're like infrared for like following a wall but like primarily it was that bumper and like fumbling around but they've gotten way more advanced since then i mean i i yeah interviewed someone on here who worked for irobot and like i mean they do slam now like i think it's running ross you know at this point oh. and, you know, pretty pretty advanced stuff i think yeah, ross is ross is my my personal like nightmare Oh jeez. <laughs> uh, that's just a different, different segue. What's actually I think I think Ross was alright, but Ross too is just giving me a headache. Why is that? I, I haven't um, messed around with Ross two really yet. Uh they're pushing it pretty hard and like I feel like it's not fully developed. Or at least parts of it isn't, like the motor control is what I've been working on a lot. And uh looking through the code it just seems more like it feels very much like just a bunch of like students who have nothing else better to do than to like create administrative tasks and like like practice their object oriented design. Oh jeez. Like, <laughs> they just it, I don't know. I am I'm, I'm I'm very like procedural. I'm 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 more of a C than a C plus plus guy. Um but even then like it, it's it's very I feel like they made they developed it so that it is optimized for simulations. So when you try to actually um, deploy it on an actual robot and like use actual motor controllers, uh, it it's you kind of have to do a bunch of hacks to get it to work. So huh. I did. That's um, interesting, and that's more unique to ROS two than ROS one. Um... Yeah, Ross one is fine. Like I, uh, one of the first things I did uh, was migrate um, motor control code from Ross one to Ross two. Yeah, and like Ross one, it just works. Like it's it's pretty straightforward and it's simple. And like you know the parameters like are set up like you know they're, they're really easy to like work with. Um, Ross two they had a complete overhaul, which is fine. Um, 
but I feel like it, it like lost functionality or like it like things aren't as straightforward anymore that you have to kind of do this weird thing so that they can like abstract their stuff to work in simulations. And if you want to abstract so it works in like all of those different cases, that's where it gets pretty weird. It sounds like. Yeah, like I, I was struggling just to propagate an error code, like huh. a status word, which is a pretty basic thing that you should be able to do. For sure, you would think that's the advantage of like a pub sub system. Yeah, but you can't. But the way they did it, it was like you're no longer creating a node; you're creating a, a hardware interface. So you don't have access to the node anymore because you're just an interface. And so you have to like utilize the the API that's there as an interface to like push things, and it, it, it was a whole. I might have just been doing it wrong. I don't know. Yeah. Like, um, and even then, like it was just it's, there's so little documentation on how ROS two works. Yeah. Like, there's a lot of like high level PowerPoints, but there's not a whole lot of like, hey, this is how you use it. Or, like, yeah. API. Hey, this is ROS one. This is how you do in ROS two. Like it's just. It just feels like a very much a work in progress of a bunch of nerds in basements, just like yeah, fun, fun <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> that's how it felt a few years ago. The last time I tried to get near it, but um, I mean, admittedly, like that's not my expertise. I'm I'm more of like a hardware specialist. So, okay. I, um, I mean, you know, we'll, we'll use Ross um, mainly for the simulation stuff on projects, but. Um, I don't know. It, it, we've not made it like integral to a whole lot of the stuff we've worked on. I guess Rutro had it in in the autonomy. It used ROS one. So. Yeah, it feels like they're they're pushing it so that people will develop it sometimes. Because there there definitely is a push uh, from the ROS guys to like, you know, they're they're they're, they're discontinuing. Uh, like they're no longer like releasing stuff for ROS one. Like, oh, that's like, interesting. Um, it's just going to be stuck in Noetic, and um, they're purely focusing on Rust 2, so like, they're kind of being forced to use Rust 2, but it's not fully developed, so it's almost it's almost like they want you to just get frustrated with it and like improve it for them. Oh, the yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, it might be the case. Um, I don't know. I, I'm so far from it. I, I don't have a strong opinion on on Ross or Ross too, but I, I like asking people because, like, you know, that's it's just good good information to have. Have you had anyone that was excited about Ross too? Um, <laughs> yeah, probably. Really? Um, well, I don't know like Ross two in particular, but like, um, I guess well. I don't know. I mean, there's some people that I think always want like the latest, you know, technology and like people like that probably are excited by Ross too. So some people come to mind. Um, I know like years ago, like there was a big thing about like how you could like do fleet management for like a heterogeneous fleet of robots with Ross too. I don't know if that's still a part of it, but that seemed oh, to be sure. something people were excited about like a bit ago. Um, I, um, I don't know. I've talked to a few. I've talked to a few people who. Uh, it seems like the common line is we're using ROS one, but we're working on using ROS two, and that yeah. seems to be a common. You know, I mean, that's what you're doing. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's, a, it's a whole. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It's like the part of robotics. Just I guess software in general that I really hate. Of like, you know, you learn all this cool stuff in college. And like you gain all these like cool skills of like doing like you know slam and like all these algorithms and like yeah, um, but I feel like most of your day to day is either reading documentation, writing documentation, or just like going through poorly documented code trying to figure out how to use it, <laughs> or like trying to get your developer environment to work. You know, like what what yeah, libraries yeah. and packages or do you have to import in what order to get yeah, that just running? Like admin stuff. That was yeah, that was definitely. That was one of the things, like, so, I mean, again, I, I haven't, like, written software in maybe, like, 10 years now, um, but, I mean, I'll, I'll still look at the Git, like, if I'm, you know, administrating a project with a software element, um, but that was one of the reasons I kind of got away from that was, like, I've I've run SolidWorks more recently than I've tried to write code, uh, just because it's, like, a little more pleasant for me, the way my brain works. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I mean... 
like you said, just the admin you got to do just to get it to work. I mean, I would think if you're in like a really good, I don't know, like, I guess there's only so much DevOps can do, especially on the R&D side, where like that's probably not even a DevOps function to help you get your IDE running. You know, like that's that's on you. Yeah. But like, I wonder. Yeah. I don't know. I haven't done. I I kind of wonder, like, you know, do people at like Google or like, you know, like these just massive Fortune five companies get like help with that sort of stuff, so they're not spending as much, you know, like roboticist brain mm -hmm. time on you know, you know, soul crushing admin, or is that something everyone has to contend with? Because at a certain point, you know, you can't necessarily delegate setting up your work computer. Right. Well, there was definitely a mix in. When I was a blue belt, I think it started off when I, when we we're still very startupy of like we wanted people that could figure shit out on, yeah. on their own. Um, so it was very much like you know here's a laptop, here's a Ubuntu CD, set up yourself. Um, but towards the end, when that sounds like something Costa would ask someone to do. <laughs> All right, here you go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've never seen any, but I've I've heard stories of like people like being given that CD and laptop and just like not knowing what to do and like quitting the next day type of thing. Here's um, my resignation. Yeah. I don't know how to install an OS. Yeah, some of those lines. Oh, geez. Uh, but I bad. also like towards, towards the end, like we, we were hiring pretty rapidly and it was like, okay, we can't spend time bringing new people up to speed like over and over again. Yeah. Um, but I remember like one of the last things I did on my way out was, uh, basically create a package manage like a package installation system for like all of our tools and all of our libraries and stuff and like basically like automating setup for people's computers. That's pretty cool. Is it like a um, Docker function or is that something different? Uh no this was this was Debian. It was just like I, I set up a Debian package so it was nice. just like you know app get install uh blue belt tools and like you would just get all the the necessary packages and like tools and stuff. Sweet. Um like Docker was around then, but like we we hadn't adopted it yet. Um, we're using it heavily now. It's actually I don't know. I was really against it initially, but it's actually kind of cool. Yeah, it seems neat. Uh, I, I again just because I don't do software in my day to day really anymore. I've not personally gotten much time behind the wheel with it, but it in principle it seems like an awesome tool to me. Like I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah, I will admit. Like, I don't know. It, like there's a few things I was forced to adopt that I wasn't a big fan of. Um, Docker initially was one of those things, but um, I mean, I, I kind of came come more from an embedded systems background. So, like for me, it's just like I'll grade another layer. Like I'm gonna put like an operating system, and then you're gonna put a Docker like container, and then you're gonna put ROS on top of that, and just kind of like, <laughs> and all of this just like make a freaking LED blink, like. Really, <laughs> but uh, but uh, no, it's, it, there's a lot of really cool things you can do with it. Um, it, it's uh, like you have to kind of see it in action and kind of like use it. I mean, I don't know. That, I, I guess, yeah. Uh, well, just the fact that you yeah, can well, like deploy, you know, like the same environment over and over and over again, you know, like ad infinitum, like is is what appeals to me about Docker, like at least in theory. Yeah, or just like plug and play different like nodes or different like modules of the system. Um, which would, which you would not be able to do without it. Um, just like, hey, I want to use like this thing that uses a completely new set of different set of libraries, but I want to just like, you know, pull this out and put this in, like stand, like this little standalone like uh, container that just like does what it needs to do. That's pretty cool. Um, yeah, like you don't have to worry about like all the cross dependencies and stuff, um, or like uninstalling this version of Python because this other thing uses that specific version and like it's uh I've not, yeah, it's pretty cool i've not done it as much but can't you like have it set up so that you can run like two different versions and different dockers and then you can like communicate with those or is that am i am i getting it wrong um kind of i mean you're you basically the, the overhead is still just one os but administratively you're you're kind of running two different systems with the overhead of one system. That's interesting. That yeah. So it's like um, you said, it's another layer. 
Yeah, because I, I thought it was like a virtual machine type of thing where like, okay, it's, 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 it's going to like take up a lot of resources. Uh, but we had a system that was running like, um, like it, it, it was, okay, we, we were kind of doing some weird shit, but there was a good like, I want to say like 12 different containers all running simultaneously on one robot. And it wasn't like, it didn't seem practical because we'd literally have like one node just doing like diagnostics and another node doing like motors and another node just controlling a single camera. And in my head, like if, we, if you look at it, if you think of them as virtual machines, it's like, okay, you're running an entire machine just to like get images from a camera, you know? Yeah. Um, but like there's, there was practically no overhead. Like they, they're all running and like communicating with each other. And That's pretty fine. slick. Um, what kind of physical compute did you have on that robot? Uh, we were using a uh, video Orin. Oh, okay. That's yeah. got some balls on it. Uh, not really. Like the, the GPU is pretty pretty hefty, but like the CPU itself is like it's just a it's a ARM like what? Eight, I forgot if we have the eight core or sixteen cores. I think it's sixteen. Um, I mean that strikes I mean, me like, like a decent amount of compute. But <laughs> I could I could be yeah wrong. until you like. Yeah, but then you look, if, when you open up your phone, you realize like your phone is like, uh, you know, it's running eight cores or sixteen cores or whatever. And, like, yeah, but your phone's also a decent amount of compute. Like I don't know. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Weird times that we're living in. Yeah, I, I, I guess it depends on your benchmark, right? Like, so if I yeah, I'm an old man. Like I look at like you know what was done like ten years ago. I'm like that wouldn't have been you know it just didn't have the technology even five years ago. You know. Yeah, we were uh, we were having a conversation about the turbo button earlier today at work. The turbo Remember button. That? Yeah, like in Pentium ones or like were they were they even Pentium at that point? <sighs> we're like we're talking like back when they were, back when computing. Power yeah, was like yeah, you could push that turbo button on the front of that. I I do remember that now. Would it, would yeah, it was like it, it just an, overvolting or what the hell was it doing? It was an anti-turbo. You what? always ran on turbo, but like there are certain video games that were clocked to the to the, to the clock they like they were they were synced to the clock not to the cpu clock not to like time yeah so when you increased the processor um computing uh like the, the processor uh, speed it would make the game actually faster like yeah. faster so you have to like de-turbo your that computer makes sense or else like CPU. mario's moving around like he's on amphetamines yeah, exactly. And like you're you're just not gonna win the game because it's yeah. going like, you know, twenty three percent faster than yep. than it's supposed to be. Um but like we marked they you know, they marketed it as turbo, but it was it was just regular speed. And you you de turboed your computer to play video games. That's interesting. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Now that's I yeah, feel that, like that was that, always that, fun with the emulators too, when you're trying to like emulate like a legacy gaming platform um and you know it's going off clock speed and like the computes just evolved way past yeah exactly yeah <laughs> and so yeah it just doesn't doesn't work or you've got to figure out a way to to force you know like a way slower clock speed in order to get it to yep. render correctly yeah i hated that as a kid i'll just like press a button and it's like game over and I'm like what what why <laughs> <laughs> Like running about running my Pentium Four, like trying to trying to like run this like legacy game from the nineties. That's amazing. I found yeah. there was one uh, called Starship Titanic that was like a Douglas Adams game that I I made like a project. Oh out of yeah. Game. Oh yeah, you know it. Yeah, yeah. Wasn't that a? Oh, wasn't that like a? Uh, um. Uh, what's it called? Like a like. You, I forgot, what I forgot what they're called. Like you just you just write commands onto a keyboard. I think so. It was like a text based, but I mean there were graphics too. But it was like static graphics, and they like rendered like lots of different robot characters basically. But like you know they, it's definitely it was like a weird aesthetic, you know. Um, and then yeah, I think you. I don't know if it, it might have been partially um, like puzzle. It was it kind of reminded me of Mist if you remember that game. Yeah, 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 like where you're trying to like, yeah, like figure you, out how to get through this world and solve puzzles like as you're going. Yeah, we were also talking about mist. Oh man, this is yeah. I don't. Know. Yeah, we were talking about mist uh, earlier today. We we're talking about like internet cafes. Internet like, cafes. I, uh, oh, I forgot about those. Yeah, because I would get stuck. Now it's in, just like, called a cafe. Cafe. 
yeah just you just take your or, or it's just it's your phone and you're yeah. taking it to wherever well you, okay it's so your, internet cafes had computers in them that you could then use yeah yeah back in access to the internet back when like internet was super expensive like not everyone had it at their home yep yeah that's interesting and then public libraries also did that or like they probably still do i mean yeah, I think, yeah, yeah. Well, I've only been I've only been to them for the printer. <laughs> nice. So I guess technically you could just sit there and like browse the internet. Yeah, yeah. I, I think, I think that's... Kinko had a had a computer you could just use. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken. At least last time I was in the, in the U.S., I had to go to Kinko's. Internet cafes were kind of kind of fun. I mean, like I don't know. I feel like it's yeah, like it we'll... kind of creates like a like a non-social environment though because everyone's like doing their own thing on a computer. So. Like, so we were talking about this at work because uh, internet cafes were very different here. Uh, maybe because like the population was way younger, um, they all kind of turned into gaming cafes. Oh, interesting. Like, so like, so like people walk, are... you walk you're like, yeah, because they're all networked together. You're playing so, a LAN game. Yeah, exactly. You you would just show up with like you know like five six of your friends and just play Counter Strike like in a, well, that's cool. in a cafe. Is... Because, is the uh, were you involved in the Carnegie Mellon Robotics Club when you were a student at all? Um, no, I had a good reason for why I didn't. I don't remember why. Yeah, I, I thought they were fun, I had, but there were a lot yeah, of land parties friends. there. Yeah, I had friends that were in it, um, but I didn't get involved for some reason. I'm not sure why. Yeah, I liked it. I, I thought um, it was really fun. Uh, I got involved when I was an undergrad at University of Pittsburgh and started uh just getting heavily and i stayed involved when i was a grad student at carnegie mellon so yeah, yeah. no we totally crossed paths but i'm just trying to, i don't remember how like we know a lot of similar people yeah for sure <laughs> yeah swimming in the same ponds yep because uh um yeah because like yeah you had the uh, armstrong cruise uh, or Nick, like on on your pod, like not too long Yeah, ago. Nick's great. I I, I yeah, really yeah. really like that guy. Um, yeah, and I mentioned it, but he was my uh, he was my TA for all my classes uh, while I was there. That's wild. Like, <laughs> yeah, I was like, kind of shocked. I was like, oh man, like, yeah. I haven't seen this guy in ages. I might have been living I mean, on his couch when he was your TA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because uh, I mean, he probably doesn't remember me because I was just like one of like a bunch of students um, in his class. But uh, yeah, he was a pretty cool guy. Yeah, no, he's he's, he's very, a good human being. He's he's like very down to earth and yeah, yeah. There was there was definitely some uh, weird like elitist complex that a lot of kids had at CMU. I felt yeah, that's that, for like, sure. He, yeah, and he was generally just like trying to get us through classes and like you know trying to help us out. It was kind of cool. Yeah, yeah, for sure. No, I mean, like I don't know. I stayed in his couch. He was helpful to me. <laughs> so. Fair. Yeah, give me give me a place to stay for like a month when I was taking time off school and I had no money. So, yeah, solid yeah. solid human being. I, I I really like him a lot. It was him and he had a roommate, Pat Bennett, who was getting a PhD in mathematics, and then they owned a duplex, and then they had like two guys living underneath them. I think you and I talked about this. Like, yeah, yeah. I don't know if they were students or what, but like they Nick one time had me. Um, pretend to be an electrician like to like replace some breakers or something so he could save some money on like his tenants place <laughs> nice. he's like just act like you're an electrician <laughs> so, that's kind of funny yeah there's, there's some there's some weird laws and because i had a i had a duplex for a while in pittsburgh and like there was some interesting laws about that it was like i could do my own electrical work but i wasn't technically supposed to do electrical work for my tenants but if they're shared, then okay. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah, because like you, there, there are no laws saying that you can't work in your own house, but there are laws saying that you can't work on unless you have a, a license. You cannot work on like rental property. But if your house is your rental property, it's like your area. Yeah, that makes sense. And it's like, um, I mean, it's not like it's difficult to to put in a circuit breaker or, or run a wire or like any of that stuff. I mean. Uh, it isn't, but knowing the knowing which which gauge to use. And sure, stuff, yeah, use, yeah, 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 right? for sure. Twenty um, twenty amp uh, would be twelve gauge, right? 
and then 15 app is 14 gauge and then i think 30 sure app law, is 10 gauge i'm pretty sure the law wasn't meant for like people like you it was more meant for like you're like hey where's the wire let's do it <laughs> yeah <laughs> fair <like>. enough <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's the same, you know, ampacity, uh, you know, in cross-sectional areas and, and robot electronics bays. So. Yeah. yeah, true. Yeah, an amp's an amp. <laughs> so. so I was a little curious about this because, like, I, so I did a lot of electrical work when I was in the U.S. And um, I then moved here and, even... and I did a little bit of electrical work at, like, at home. Yeah. Wait. yeah. And then I saw what the guys were using um uh in the lab and i never realized i never thought about this but there are so many different like i wouldn't say standards but like so many different uh uh norms i guess for like wiring uh because when i was in the u.s like every like everything was just lug nut. you know not lug nut, but like those, those like twist um, oh the wire nuts yeah 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 like wire nuts and like like that, that's what everyone like wired their houses and like their like, yeah, they're super right. janky. Can you imagine if you tried to subject that to like any kind of like, I mean, I guess there's no earthquakes in in Pittsburgh really, but like if you tried to subject that to like any kind of a static or like no, sorry, a dynamic, right. uh, you know, structure, like you'd be it would shake apart immediately. I mean, there's like there's no yeah. way. Well, same with solid core okay. versus multi core. I mean, you know, like if you use solid core and the thing jump ropes up and down, you know, eventually you're gonna have a fatigue track. Uh, fatigue fracture. I thought you're not supposed to, use, supposed to use solid core in a, in a twist nut. You can or use no. solid core in houses. I've seen it used in twist nuts. I'm pretty sure oh. you can use solid core in a twist nut. I, I don't know. I could be wrong. Okay. but Yeah. I remember trying to like learn all this. And I was just like confused. But then I moved here and like no one, knows what, no one knew what a twist nut was. Yeah. Well, and nobody's using... Mm -hmm multi-core on like household wiring right and everybody uses twist nuts on household wiring yeah, yeah. yeah like i've true. never seen multi-stranded label cable used on like i don't know i feel like it's like romex which is all solid core yeah. i don't know that's interesting so nobody uh nobody in kuwait or uh united Arab emirates uses twist nuts but i mean I, i've never seen them in stores like whenever i went to a hardware store like my mind just went like you know because i was doing stuff in the US and yeah. like went to a hardware store I'm just like hey where the twist nuts and like try to explain it and they're just looking at me weird like that's a bizarre concept why would you use that yeah and then um, I don't know maybe because I'm a like you know nerdy ass software guy but like it never occurred to me that like yeah different places wire things differently it's probably good not to um, use twist nuts <laughs> to be honest like I don't know what I they're guess, using over the there but I guess twist nuts were just kind of like the first thing I thought of because I, 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 I used a bunch of them when yeah. I was working in my house but, uh, I've used them too. Um, no, just like there, there's a lot of different like uh, tools and like standards, I guess, that like are different. Country what do people country. use in place of twist nuts? Um, and uh, I guess it would have been Kuwait when you had just gotten back. Um, I don't remember. Uh, no worries. <laughs> just curious. Yeah, because I only did like I wasn't like doing any like extensive like home renovation or anything. It was just like you know like I just kind of fixed the light fixture. Um, yeah, but uh, oh, it's gonna bother me. This, I mean, it was a while ago. And I didn't do as many of those as I did twist nuts, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, it makes sense, right? Because I mean, there's, there's Different, different I can think of a few ways you like would that. do it, but yeah, I don't know if any of them are, are what you found in stores. I think it was like some sort of weird terminal. Yeah, um, that makes sense. Like, that like seems multi that seems like a better approach. Yeah, it was just like screw terminals on both sides, and you just kind of like yeah, read them in. I mean, I guess the downside is like now you've got to find space for that, which is a little bit tricky, but yeah, but then finding space for for a twist nut is really annoying too because if you if you like try to tuck it somewhere and you end up accidentally like untwist pull it, one of the wires it, out like yeah yeah, yeah for sure like, you know, so i've you never had that happen to me <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah me, me neither just everything just you know i shoved that i shoved it into the uh the outlet and just yeah or like um 
uh, there's like that janky knob and tube wiring and like uh, oh, the building. Man. Yeah, I've got like an apartment and a building with really janky wiring. And so if I ever try to point it, it just disintegrates <laughs> like when you twist the twist nut, like if you touch the insulation. So, yeah, I didn't have a, there was knob and tube. There was like the 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 remnants of the knob and tube in uh, in in the place that I that I bought, but uh, it wasn't actually live. Yeah, well, that's good at least that you weren't using it. Yeah, but it, it just kind of blew my mind that like this is normal. Like you just had exposed wire, like, <laughs> just you know. Yeah, exactly. Just hanging out in the basement. Um, it's super fucking yeah. janky. Yeah, I agree. Cool. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm definitely sh- learning a lot. What kind of stuff? Oh, just because I, I we, we have these like two crazy Germans at the lab, and uh, <laughs> they're they're very very like they take things like really seriously with like wiring and stuff. Uh, so it's just kind of cool like seeing uh, seeing that. Nice. Um, like all the different like uh, solutions I guess out there that I don't know. I, I always looked at robotics like wiring and stuff from like a hobbyist perspective, so it's kind of cool seeing it from the, like a professional um, perspective. Yeah, um, that's awesome. Uh, we were talking about wiring, and right? Well, that's I a was difference. really frustrated. <laughs> yeah, I was really frustrated because, and I was is, curious this, what the German is, guys did. Yeah, this is the shit that I deal with at work all the time because I have an American laptop, <laughs> and the plugs here are UK plugs. Nice. Yeah, so those are fucking I tremendous. Have, uh, you very yeah, so large. I always have like a bunch of like. Um, adapters just lying around my house all the time because I constantly have to like do this shit. Yeah. And uh, even though all the plugs here are British, a lot of the appliances here are from Europe. <laughs> so you would get like, you know, a laptop with an American plug, an iron with a German plug, and like try to figure out how to put that into like a UK socket. Yeah. Um, it's just like, a general struggle we had growing up in the region in general. Huh. So you, um, you're getting electronics from everywhere and you just have to be able to adapt it to a UK socket. But like, uh, yeah. UAE is a fairly new country though, right? Like, I mean, does that mean the infrastructure is new too? Like I would think it would be because all the, the amount of building UAE is yeah, doing so is through uh, the roof. Yeah. So the, the, the standard they decided to use was British. Okay. Got, um, it. got it. Got it. Got it. Got but it. like not, but, you know, you got, you got to buy stuff and, like, we don't make everything. Actually, not, nothing's really made here, uh, electronics-wise. Except robots. Um, yeah. Uh, no, there's a handful of other things. But, yeah. um, but I mean, like, all, all, the, all the heavy machinery that we have at work, uh, probably because there's, like, the two German guys. Yeah. Uh, a lot of it's, like, from German manufacturers. That makes sense. Um, so we have, like, a total hodgepodge of <laughs> sockets uh, in the lab. And does that mean you guys are used to have right? Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but does that mean your electricians are dropping like German outlets like in certain places and like UK outlets in other places, or you have like adapters? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and we used to have a bucket of adapters, which is now empty. Nice. Because uh, now, you know, on top of that, we also get like parts from the US. Like our uh, our Orins have uh, US power supplies. Yeah, makes sense. So we got to like. Um, yeah, I currently have, I don't remember what it was, but I have two layers of adapters plugged in. I have like a US socket that plugs into an adapter into a UK, uh, like a, it's a UK adapter, and then converting that back into a German socket so that I can plug it into the desk that I'm using. That's pretty funny. Uh, yeah, so there's, uh, yeah, there's a lot of that. That's That's pretty awesome. I mean, it seems like the U- the biggest difference between like the U.S. and the rest of the world is that the U.S. wants to use like one ten, you know, AC, where like the rest of the world wants to use like two twenty AC. I don't know if there's yeah. exceptions to that that you've noticed, but Japan. What's Japan using? Uh, it's split in two. Um, I think they. It's it's one. One is like, so one part of Japan was contracted out to a US <laughs> company. I think that's the northern part of Japan. And the southern end part was some other 
country, but uh, they're both roughly 100 hertz. Like one is 110, the other side, the other side is 100. And then they went with 100 but, hertz, which nobody uses anywhere else in the world that I know. Oh, sorry, did, did, sorry, did I say hertz or did I say? Sorry, I meant volts. Oh, okay, okay. Sorry. Um, but one side is 50 volts, and the other side is or one one side is 50 hertz, and the other side is 60 hertz. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, the cool thing is most things that are made in Japan now just accept anything. That's awesome. All set up to run between 100 and 240 and like between 50 and 60 hertz. Um, That's pretty sweet. From my understanding, the early years, it was really frustrating because something that was like an appliance that was made for the northern like Tokyo market wouldn't work down in Osaka. That blows. Yeah. Um, and it's not even like a voltage thing. Like you actually needed to like figure out a way to change the frequency of the AC like <laughs> power, which is like a variable um, frequency drive function, which is very expensive. And yeah, you can't you can't just plug it into a transformer. Like you actually had to like you know have some sort of logic like to doing that. Yeah, yeah, that's, um, that's not cheap. Yeah, but. Uh, yeah, um, I will say that the U.S. is one of the few places that makes appliances like purely for the U.S. market because almost everything else is just like it, it plugs into almost anything, right? Yeah. When I was but, thinking, you I mean, could. US... Oh, sorry. After you. Well, I was just saying the U.S. is the big market, so like they can afford to do that, right? Like if you have some like Etsy guy who's making some weird cool table, like he doesn't have to worry about like selling it outside of the U.S. because there's enough of a market within the country. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. The frequency thing, though, kind of like you're right. That 50 versus 60 hertz is kind of a bit of a, a bit of an annoyance, <laughs> for sure. Yeah, so, yeah. It's like, what do you what do you do? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean there, there's solutions now, but like you know, back then you can just turn to a transformer. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Transformers were also very much a thing growing up. Like everyone had just transformers, and they're like like appliance transformers. Like to to step like up or down the voltage, basically. Yeah, because uh, Kuwait worked on two forty, but like, you know, what if you wanted a fridge from the U.S.? Like, you need to, like step that down to hundred volts. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, or like my dad who managed to get a hold of a sharper image catalog and got super excited about a treadmill, <laughs> and then realized he couldn't use it, so he had to get a transformer. That's pretty funny. On that. Must have been like a decent sized transformer too, though, because of the amount of current. It's like, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it was pretty normal growing up. But I, I, I don't know. There's, there's a lot of things I never thought. But that about, doesn't like, account for the for the frequency shift, though. That's interesting. I oh, know it was sixty hertz. Oh, okay, yeah, you're fine. Right. Yeah, it's, it's only Japan and like. Doesn't Europe do fifty did. hertz? Some like parts, certain, yeah. Like I don't know. Yeah, Europe was a whole clusterfuck because like each country had its own plug, its own voltage, its own uh, frequency. I would just start cutting um, off plugs and just re-terminating with UK, you know, <laughs> like uh, mail. We uh, would do that. Yeah, we we would do that, but then uh, we had a snafu where um, we had a charging station that we were kind of also using as like a central kind of like point. Um, and the charging station, whatever outlets we had, we, we didn't, we couldn't find a British plug. So we had a German plug. So then it was like, uh, we ended up hard wiring a lot of, uh, a lot of our, our power cords. That's interesting. Like, wait, just hard wiring into the wall? Um, no, just like for the different, like things that we installed. But yeah, we like splice some wires and re reconnect, like, like. Reterminate them in this kind of a common that's, occurrence. That's pretty interesting. I would think I, I'm surprised, and I, I maybe there is a market for this, and I just don't know about it. But I would think like you'd start just installing like you know whatever the three most common outlets were, like on a receptacle plate, you know, and just being like you know you can plug into this outlet, and maybe it's larger because you need a transformer, like you said, but you know or like maybe you get ones with common yeah. frequencies and voltages and you only put those on on a particular face plate but you know it's like people are throwing usb on face plates now so like how hard would it be to have That's like true. you know uk and german like on the same face plate and then you know, plug in either one 
Yeah, we have a little bit of that, but then like you, you're you're always missing like you always end up having to use an adapter anyway. Yeah, that's so fair. then it's like okay, now I need now I need two Germans. Like, uh, well, it says a German and a British, so you need a, you know. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> um, but I think that's more of the region rather than uh, the lab in particular, or just some stuff that we grew up with. Yeah, well, and I mean, if you're anything like me, which you are, I mean, that you're just running a ton of devices. Like, yep. I, I don't know, like whenever I go into like a new space, like power strips or like I, I run a lot of power strips and like often like extension cords or will drop new outlets, you know, and like just try to make it be able to run the kind of power that the sorts of things I'm doing require because yeah. it's, it's more I than mean, the average user. <laughs> yeah, like I said before, my mom's Japanese, so like we were in a Kuwaiti household. But she insisted on getting a bunch of like Japanese appliances. <laughs> but yeah, we you know growing up with transformers and adapters was like. I've been wanting one of those Zerushi rice cookers for a really long time now. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I I need to get one. They're, they're super they're nice. Expensive, yeah, what are they up to? Like I, I think it was like two fifty, ish, like U.S. Uh, dollars yeah, last here, time I looked. Yeah, here they run for like. What do you have to convert? Uh. Looks like four. No, wait. yeah, they go. They go as high as like four hundred dollars here. Oh wow. Okay. Um, I'm not sure why. Like, I don't know. The, the way the supply chain here works is is. Uh, I don't fully understand it. Like, we have Amazon here, but. Uh, like, like there's an Amazon like like local branch of Amazon, like Amazon by AE. All right, um, since you've been googling, I'm gonna I'm gonna search and see how much Sarushi has cost here. Uh, you'd have a you'd have an easier um, you'd have an easier time because you can just get them direct from Japan because if they use the same plugs. I'd have to get an adapter here, or like an export. Uh, oh yeah, it's like two hundred bucks. Export version. Maybe maybe three hundred for like a nicer one. Yeah, uh, no, they're nice. Um, yeah, they're not super expensive. You know, you know how they work, right? Like the the, the basic rice cooker. It's actually really simple technology, like the original ones. Um, all it is is that, uh, so you know, if something has water in it, it doesn't go higher than 100 degrees or Celsius. Yeah. Right. Because the water's blowing off. Yeah, but makes as sense. As soon as all the water, as soon as all the water blows off, like that's when, whatever it is you're cooking can actually exceed get burned. 100 degrees. Yeah. Well, not necessarily burned, but like it, it'll exceed 100 degrees. Um, yeah. So the original you're probably gonna burn the edges of your rice at that point. I don't know. <laughs> It's not a bad thing. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, that can be very like good. That. I like it. It's my favorite thing on a paya. Um, but the um, yeah, they just have a switch based on heat. So like, if uh, if the container ever goes over 100 degrees, that means the water's boiled off, which generally means your rice is fully cooked. Oh, uh, that's it would cool. actually trigger. Yeah, so just based on the temperature, it would trigger a switch, and just turn the the heating element off. Oh, so like the low key cheapy boys you get that are probably still doing that, where they've just got a thermal yeah. switch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, 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 that's all a rice cooker really is—is is just uh, a thermal switch. Well, not therm- I don't know what they call. But like, I feel system, like but... the Zarushi ones are like more sophisticated than that. I don't know. Like they're they talk about like fuzzy yeah. logic was like they use that as like a marketing term in like the early two thousands. Yeah. Some of those. Yeah, but I mean, in the end of the day, it's uh, it's just monitoring the temperature, and as soon as the water boils off, temperature spikes, turns it off. Yeah, that's, that's fair. It. So even if it's like a better control implementation, it's just effectively doing the same thing. Yeah, so I think the logic comes for like because you can do you can you can do other things with it, like you can steam. Yeah. Um. So the original ones, you, it would just keep steaming until the water boils until the water evaporates. All yep. the water evaporates, right? Um. I think these are set up to like steam at a certain like profile oh that's pretty cool and like uh they have like different functions but yeah at the end of the day it's just uh like i always wanted one just because like yeah japanese pride but like yeah, yeah like the cheap like ten dollar ones are yeah good i'm running like a thirty dollar one that's like pretty crappy but it's awesome and like you know it's i, I still love it like i don't know it makes my rice really good and i'll steam dumplings yeah, all day it- long yeah, and if you open it up, it's it's literally just a switch. The entire logic is just a switch yeah. that 
that flips when you hear the sim temperature. Which well, is the, this one's like a little fancier. It looks to be, but I bet you're right that that's how they're actually doing it. Because like it's got like a touch. Well, not it's got not got a touch screen, but it's got like a numeric display on the front and has like all these okay. buttons for different modes. But I mean, I'm sure that the the logic's not. It probably has a micro in it because of what it's doing. But I'm sure it's not doing that complicated. Of it's still probably just like a thermal trigger where you know it's off or on based yep. on the hundred C. Yep, uh, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, I don't know. I like this type of stuff where like figure out how shit works. Yeah, yeah, for sure. No, it's really interesting. I mean, and a lot of those same control principles apply to like the robot stuff. So I mean, I think that that yep. scales over nicely. Yeah, exactly. Nerf guns are also a great uh, source of inspiration. Did you say Nerf guns? Yeah. <laughs> you really did get a CMU. Nerf, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I'm just saying for like for a toy, there's a lot of engineering in Nerf guns, and it's kind of really cool to like. I mean, there's like there's like engineering web pages on like where they take apart Nerf guns and look at like all the different like valves and stuff. That's interesting. So I've never gotten like super into Nerf gun modding. It was huge when I was I was at uh, at university as well. Like I don't know. There's just a. I mean, you know this. There's a huge Nerf community at CMU, and like that's like, it's a bunch of nerds. Yeah, yeah, I remember the walks from head. With the human v zombie um, matches they'd have, and like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I just liked it from this. I don't know it was. I, I never thought about it until uh, one of the mechanical engineers at Blue Belt kind of like pointed it out. But like, there's all these little things that they do, and uh, it's it, you know it's just it's just a toy, but, um, like those those like three in one shot, uh, guns where like you, you load them up and just like fire and then like you fire them one at a time. Huh. But there's valves in there that like sense which uh, chamber has a dart in it or not, and if there's not a dart in it, it closes off um, that valve. Wait, really? Yeah, like if you if you look inside the the barrel, there's a little like um, like a little switch basically, and like when the dart's in place, it like opens up. Oh, that's interesting. Valve. So yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And if multiple valves are open, it like mechanically directs the the air towards one of them and then when that closes it'll go towards the next one because there's and not a dart there com- anymore yeah and like no matter what combination uh you place those darts in there it'll always kind of like fire off in, a, in, the, in the, correct, the correct pattern that's pretty awesome yeah and then yeah, if you inspirational yeah for sure no i mean it, it there's definitely uh you know you don't really see like analog circuitry or, or straight mechanical logic anymore so it's cool when you get to see that get used still yeah yeah i mean it, it's also kind of refreshing for me because whenever i try to like solve some like problem and i like fucking overcomplicate shit and then realize that like you know mechanically this could be solved and it's like really simple and i'm just like thinking about things the wrong way yeah, yeah for sure uh, that's that's interesting i mean yeah, I I could open a whole can of worms around that. <laughs> I'm like thinking we should probably wrap up soon. Yeah, fair enough. Um, I, just, I gotta get to dinner. Um, so yeah. Um, is there anything you want to plug? Anything you want people to think of, like on the tail end of the episode? Um, just parting parting words. Uh, no, I thought. I mean, I kind of just. I kind of just went off. Yeah, we just we kind of were, were talking, yeah. but all good. Um, yeah, so much. Uh, check out. Yeah, uh, yeah no, I had a really good time. Yeah, this is this is fun. Um, I don't know, maybe for like people listening, like check out like Debay Future Foundation. Um, would be one thing. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, we. I feel like we're not we're not putting ourselves out there as much as uh, we could. Um definitely very much a local uh sort of target um in terms of like the, our media outlets but uh no it's it's real um we do some pretty cool stuff um it's it's not just you know a bunch of guys buying stuff off the shelf and like putting a sticker on it like we're actually building stuff and uh yeah i don't know watch out for us we're those are cool things that's really awesome oh dude thanks for coming on had a, had a really good time yeah, Thanks for joining us today. If you made it this far, chances are you'll like other episodes too. 
Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, and Radio Public. Subscribe today to get notified when the latest episodes release and support the channel. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Custom Robots and Machines. If you're in the market for robotics contract engineering services, please consider hiring SKA Custom Robots and Machines. They sponsor this podcast and they solve some of the toughest engineering challenges in the world. SKA Custom Robots and Machines can be found at ska.solutions. Thanks again and see you on the next one.